Well, I feel a bit gypped because the view out our window is nowhere near as pretty as this. I mean, in the distance, you got oil refineries, but up close, you got three pyramids and parking lot, but you have water views over here in the pool. Even though it's like 30 degrees outside and someone is swimming in that pool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's two or three people in that pool, actually, and it's 30 degrees outside. They are crazy. Yeah, we got the wrong end of the building. Well, here's the daytime view from our room. We have a water park and now in the summer. This might not be a bad view. But again, it's like 40 degrees outside and I don't really think they're gonna make much money at the water park right now. And that, I just realized that water ride goes in loops. That would kind of be scary. A big ship on the horizon over there too, but you can't really see it. The zoom's working okay on this camera, but I'm gonna skip out on that. Nothing happening on this end of the hotel. The lobby's over there. Lots of parking over there and parking garages right there for the hotel. Or volume or anything when we got a little technical. That sounds a little better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can get into my announcer voice. Uh, I, I am amazed that there are many of this people here because we are supposed to be talking about Legend of the Rangers, right? And I don't know. I haven't got any slideshow for you, so we don't need to look at this. I mean, if all of you have watched our pilot, we would have gone to series. Where were you people? I can't believe there's more than five people. I thought we only had five people that saw this pilot of ours. Um, so, yeah, we should be talking about Legend of the Rangers. Uh, I'll start just by saying, of course, my name is uh, Dylan Neal. For people who don't know me, um, Uh, I'm, uh, I'm an actor, has been uh, in the business probably 25 years. Uh, I was born in Canada, started my career in the, uh, in the Toronto area, started working professionally uh, in high school, and um, in 92, uh, I moved to Los Angeles and I've been there basically ever since. Um, and I've been really lucky over the years, I've had um, I think eight series regulars now to this point, um, and uh, yeah, I'm lucky I've got a new series right now called Cedar Cove with yeah! Cove in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've got a name yet, do we? Like Covers or I, I don't know what we are. Uh, lucky to be employed is what we are. In <laughs> uh, accord, Covers. Yeah, and of course, uh, for those who don't know, Bruce Boxleitner is also on the show with me. Yeah. And. Um, we're having a great time. That also is uh, is shot in Vancouver. And it's uh, me and Andy McDowell uh, with this very, very uh, family-centric uh, series on the Hallmark Channel. So it's uh, very, very PG and uh, uh, it's a very sweet show. And anyways, um, we're, we're happy to be doing that. And Nance Harrell for the Stargate people uh, in the house. Uh, yeah, we've actually got a real sci-fi kind of bent to our show. <laughs> for a show that has absolutely zero to do about sci-fi. <laughs> Yeah, we gotta have a Halloween themed uh, episode with everybody in costume somehow. It's <laughs> a great idea. And um, so let's see. Um, and so I should talk about how I guess, you know, Rangers came to me. Um, I think this is, uh, you'll, you'll help, help me out with this. I think timing wise, we're talking about 2000 now, right? Around 2000? This was done? Was it a later? 2002. Was it 2002? <laughs> I trust you guys know more than me, seriously. <laughs> Anything past a certain year is all getting a little blurry for me now. Um, and, uh, and I really didn't know much about B5. I had, uh, of course, seen it on the dial along with everybody else, but I'm not really a sci-fi guy. You know, I kind of keep up with what's generally on TV because that's part of what I do for a living, and so I pay attention. But uh, I hadn't really sat down to watch Babylon 5. And, and for the audition, uh, you know, this was just a standard audition like anything else of the thousands that I've been on now over 25 years that we all have been on as actors. Uh, and and you, you never expect too much. You know, you go and you, you hope you do well. And, um, you know, particularly when something is a pilot, uh, you know, you really want it. A, you want to get it, you want it to do well because you know, everybody wants a successful series. But, um, I just went to the audition. It was pretty straightforward reading. I remember, come up here, sir. Someone not having a handout part of the 
reaction. This is it. No one's telling me where to be. And now you're here, and you're here. The original ranger. Well, yes. And Jason and I were talking earlier. It's like we. I, we didn't get any tutorials, you know, we didn't have like, you know, here's the handbook on being a ranger, by the way, you know, it's already been done. So, so how, was your so, how was your time on Minbar? On Minbar, it was, uh, <laughs> it was that lovely. That be the only way you can get in. <laughs> I was just telling you about my audition process with uh, the whole thing you should tell us about yours after. Oh, did, you, did you sleep? I did have to audition, yes. You slept with Joe? And I slept with Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I slept with Doug now. Really? Yes. Completely different That's experience good. than you, I'm sure. With uh, Joe. So anyways, it was a, it was a, it was a real standard uh, meeting. Uh, Joe was there for the, the first reading, which is a little unusual when you have an executive producer for the first one. But anyways, um, I was called back once or twice more, and then, and then there was like a final reading. It was down to like just two guys, me and this other actor, and I forget his, his name, unfortunately. Um, and it was a bit of a sticky thing because we had uh, 17 pages for this final reading, which is quite a lot. An audition, 17 pages, but what happened was the night before, uh, Joe um, gave us another 17 pages. Okay. The night before. That sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, I've never, uh, I've never experienced that, uh, or since. I mean, 34 pages going into a, a final, it's not exactly a screen test, but it's the final reading, um, it is a, a lot. And, but I had this little trick, which is quite common now, is, um, Back then, we didn't have smartphones, so I had the, the, you know, those little mini disc recorders. And so what I would do, and maybe you've done this, right? You, you record the other person's dialogue. Yes. Right? And you yes. leave space for yourself. Yes. So I was cramming this in the night before. I did it with a cassette. I'm not a... <laughs> <laughs> both little cassettes, right? Yeah. You know? Now, now they, have, they have apps for your phone. No, I did it with a big one, with a big button. Yeah, the big button. <laughs> <laughs> Just reel to reel. You were you're talking about. Yeah, find a song Yes. Okay. And so, <laughs> I'm pretty good with, with dialogue. I, I did a soap opera years and years ago, and, and you may not learn very many good habits of being on a soap, but you do learn to memorize, uh, or you die quick. And, uh, and so I had, you know, I crammed in the night before, I took this cassette with earbuds to the auditions, I'm still like cramming this in. The other guy looked like he was ready to just die. He was so overwhelmed, like it, he was panicked about oh, this right. much dialogue. And that's probably the only reason I got the role, is I actually memorized Oh, don't talk about No, seriously. Like, that's probably why I got it. And, uh, and Joe commented later, at least you're really good with dialogue. <laughs> we know that. Uh, the other guy just looked like he was dying. And, uh, well, that's so going to impress the writer, isn't it? That's what Joe was. And Joe was there, and Doug Natter, executive producer, if you guys know that. He'd been with all of them. And, uh, so anyway, it was a bit of an arduous thing, but then I, I was also mentioning I knew nothing about your guys' universe, you know, coming into this. So once I got the role, I was going to go, oh shit, I better look this up. What did I get myself into? <laughs> and then, of course, you know, you go online and you see, oh, oh, <laughs> I'm into like one of these big tricky type deal things now, right? Yeah. And uh, so then it was just sort of cramming in the world and learning about the Rangers, you know, what it's all about and watching this guy and uh, and. Also, the long story short on ours, how it was supposed to go, our pilot was with Sci-Fi, if you remember the network, and it was a, a standalone TV movie, but it was also a backdoor pilot, and we'd always been told, you know, it was just going to be basically um, about the ratings. If, if the ratings did well enough, we're going ahead. You never know whether that's true or not. You know, Bonnie Hammer was uh, president of the company at that time. I know Babylon has had a tumultuous past with networks, and... There's always politics around any kind of series, but I think V5's had a particular tumultuous political history. And so I don't really know how it stood within the network going into it, but what happened on our, um, on our air date was uh, we were during the, um, the NFL playoffs, and <laughs> the day that we aired was a playoff game in a blizzard in New York that went into overtime. And uh, we got decimated on the East Coast. The West Coast numbers did really well. East Coast got crushed. And so, again, you know, people will say, well, you know, look what happened, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, the executives, network executives, they're very smart. They do this day in, day out. They know that if there's a game going on, they can read between the lines. They can see how this breaks down. I suspect that we were an ugly stepchild at sci-fi and, um, you know, barring a miracle, 
we were probably not going to go forward. Joe would probably know more about it behind the scenes. Maybe not. You know, often the, the talent, no matter whether you're the showrunner or whatever, you're just completely in the loop and you get the, the phone call, it's, it's yay or nay, and, and you don't know why. The same as actors, right? So um, that was it. It was, you know, it was a short-lived kind of experience. It was really fun. We all had a great time. We were all really disappointed that it didn't go, obviously. But, uh, you know, I got really fond memories, and um, that was my first time shooting, I think, a pilot in Vancouver, and now since then, basically, it's like my second home. I can't ever not get out of Vancouver now. You know, I'm on Arrow, I'm on Cedar Cove, it's Vancouver, it's Vancouver. You know, I haven't worked in L.A. in like two years. Since, uh, no, neither have I. This is another story. Well, but this is <laughs> in Michigan. <laughs> no, I moved to Louisiana. It's closer. Yeah, all right, it is all right. kind You're of L.A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we gotta get your immigration stuff all worked out, don't we? We were talking hey, about man. that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, I'm a dual citizen. I'm, I, as I said, I was born Canadian, but my whole adult career has been in LA, and then, you know, I was able to get my citizenship a long, long time ago. And it does actually play, and, and that's why I do work in Canada a lot, because you get all these tax credits for, uh, you know, having Canadian content and actors in there. And, and as, a, as a writer and as a producer, I sell shows, and, um, I've just sold a couple right now, and because I'm Canadian, it, you know, it helped, we'll, we'll get you hooked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a good painting. This is a good painting. <laughs> Business all the time. Um, let me hand this over to you, because we've only seen to have one mic. We do only really have one mic, but that's all right. Got why, why don't you, you know, tell them something about, you know, your origin. I can tell about my origin. origin. <laughs> yeah, tell us about your origin. I want to hear it. No, no, it's just, I do. just simply is that when, when I, um, does it work? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, when, when I auditioned, my agent thought it was a guest role on the science fiction series, so I wasn't going to do it. And curiously enough, they were looking for um, the role, the description of the role in the breakdown services sheet was Englishman, long hair and a beard. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't>! <laughs> Whatever. So, well, I auditioned for it and I read pages in front of Joe and just I went I went to I went to what well, you did it in Vancouver. We, we were, no, I did mine in LA. Oh, in, in well, in in um, Sun Valley in uh, uh, Studio City. Oh, Studio City. Goodness, very glad we were yeah. out. You know, the, <laughs> the Batman Five was shot in a converted factory out by a cement works, and some of the actors, I think Peter Jurassic, being one of them, and Bill Mooney used to cover their cars with sheets because at the end of the day, your car would be covered in cement dust. Oh my God! Oh yeah, because <laughs> this factory was also at the junction of two freeways. There were two freeways crossed at that point, um, which is good for me actually because there was an off ramp there, and somebody obviously had an accident. And I ended up with all my big granite boulders because they rolled down and I was, I managed to get them home in a VW. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and actually, like, like, because obviously it's in, in my um, historic tradition to be able to move large lumps of stone across. <laughs> 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 but I actually raised one up, it just managed to, you know, like, um, block, 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 back of the car, you know, do, got, got it in without damaging the trunk too much. But then somebody had a spill, obviously, off the freeway. And they towed the car, but they didn't tow, tow the granite. Hey, granite boulders, where, where's that? Anyway, that's a long story. But that was later on. Um, but the audition process, of course, then I get the call from my agent saying, oh, because I only did one audition, I think. But then I got the call, oh, you've got the job. You got it off one. I, I think that's true. And was it a series regular originally, or did it start as a guest star? Well, let me finish my tale. <laughs> That didn't affect my chance of future employment with you, did it? Shit, I just screwed up a job in Vancouver. <laughs> I, yeah, because my British passport, I could probably still do it. <laughs> the relationship works in the Canadians, something like that. You know, that's the first thing you're greeted with when you go to Canada, is a picture of the Queen. It's very true, it's weird. It's true. It's just like home. It's weird. Anyway, kind of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope, where, where's that these days? Anyway, but, uh, so I get the call from my agent, you've got the job, but it's for three years. Oh, boo-hoo. What? <laughs> well, no, I'm an actor. You don't get jobs for three years. You get, like, your job for two. If you're doing theatre, maybe you get a couple of months' run. If you're lucky, you're doing well. I didn't know when I was in London. I did manage to pull off a couple of six-month runs, but, but that's history. That's, that's a weird one. Of course, you're in theatre, so you're not getting paid much. 
Uh, British Theatre. Yeah. Not Broadway. No, West End even. My God, but you do billing in lieu of money. See, they don't pay the British anything. TV and well, no, here is like, oh my God. Because we're artists. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in your tax at my 90%. Apparently, art, best art comes out of oppression. So. <laughs> Something like that. Bloody time. Uh, so, uh, for three years, and, and then I'm being sent for, uh, for a wardrobe fitting. Because of course you say yes. But it was also ridiculous. It was, I mean, I, I divorced from my previous wife, but it was just before our marriage when I got the role. And all the people, because you don't need to know the circumstances that much, were all the friends of family and stuff like that, were all saying, oh, he's just here for his green card, he's just out for his green card. And there's all that kind of nonsense going on, and it wasn't, that wasn't the reason, whatever. I got that role, three year contract, on a TV show. I'm out in the backyard as soon as I got the news. Any kids in this room? Yes, there are. Turn them away now. Yeah. But I'm, I'm in the backyard when I got this. I just got, put down the phone, I go out into the backyard in Sherman Oaks in Los Angeles, in the valley, you know. With, so I'm, out the yard, I'm just going, ha ha! <laughs> Now, of course, LA terms, I'm a, ver I'm a catch. I've become a catch. That's not a problem, that's a good thing. <laughs> then, so I, go for my, I go for my wardrobe fitting and I'm, I'm terrified because I'm an emaciated European romantic who looks like he's dying of tuberculosis. <laughs> That's my niche. I thought that was a character. Choice. No, Daniel, oh, Daniel Day-Lewis got all my parts, but we won't talk about that. But that was the general kind of thing. And I thought, God, I'm going to look bloody terrible in Lycra. <laughs> thinking, thinking, you know, like, uh, thinking, what's that other one? Oh yeah, Star Trek. Thinking Star Trek, but, uh, but no. I got a costume that Hamlet could wear. <laughs> I got the whole, and very hot, admittedly, layers after layer after layer, and the kind of crap that you just wouldn't fight it. But if I, <laughs> I'm swinging a pike around in a cape. You know, come on. <laughs> Soldiers don't have long hair for a reason. But no, I was, um, I was, uh, so that was really good. That was, that was really good. And I had a very good time playing a great role in philosophically. Because of course the whole Minbari thing, very Eastern. And I kind of lean towards the East, I don't know whether you know, it's probably because I've got one leg longer than the other, but, <laughs> but I do lean towards the East. And, uh, so it was good, it was very good for me, very easy to identify with. And uh, Marcus is also full of guilt and stuff, and blah, blah, blah. So it was, it was a good role. It was a good role. Misplaced affection, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> Essentially, I played Space Jesus, that was the thing. No, <laughs> not there in a beard, 35 years old, wears a cape, he's a virgin! Can you imagine what it's like? Because you, you know this, when people, you're going to convey, well, you don't know from that series particularly, but you certainly know from the show, uh, is that people think you know what's going to happen next, but you don't until the script turns up. So you're going to conventions and everyone thinks you've got secrets, but you haven't. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true when you're on a series like that, you've got one writer who's doing, uh, Joe's doing that. And so I get this script, I don't know, about the fourth episode, third, fourth episodes I've done, where Marcus is confessing, because it's confession time, I can't remember the name of the episode, any fans know, no, no, that I'm a virgin. And I'm just reading the script at home and I'm going, what? <laughs> <laughs> My backstory is that I was a minor on a planet, not a young person, but somebody who's minor. I was on a, so I'm kind of working class minor, 35 year old, minor, who's a virgin. So either I was incredibly spiritually developed looking for the right person, or I just couldn't get laid. Those were my choices. <laughs> um, so obviously I chose the former choice. I was a highly spiritual developed. It's kind of a weird thing. It's like, oh. So anyway, long hair and a beard, 35 years old, a virgin, lives in a cell, if you know where the marks, and had no possessions, fights against the dark forces regardless of personal cost all the laws prevailing. If necessary, he'll steal a ship. And then ultimately gives his life in order that another person might live. <laughs> I, said to, I said to Joe at the end of, the, end of my film in 64, I, I, I said to him, well, I did say to him, is that, okay, am I dead or am I cryogenically frozen? He said, well, if there isn't a fifth season, you're dead. Might as well be. But if there is, you're cryogenically frozen. So I remain cryogenically frozen. So I was, I, was, I was a very tenacious cliffhanger for an entire season. But uh, I, I, what did I say? 
I, I said, I've got a great idea for the fifth season. You should open the cryogenic tube. And it's empty. And it's empty. And you have to roll it. He, did, he didn't, he did, he, yes, exactly. He, he didn't go for that, but, but I, don't mind being, I don't mind being Space Jesus. Anyway, that's enough from me. What about you? What do you think about me? <laughs> it's an old one. It's an oldie but a goodie. It is, it is. I, I suppose that's enough. I've been hogging this microphone because we've only got one. But you had a good go with it. Yeah. I, I was late because I don't have a hand one. Well, ask a question, somebody. Of somebody. We started talking about this on Twitter about that character's name was David, and did Joe at any point want to make that uh, the David of Delanin? And uh, their child. Talking from the original, uh, see, I wouldn't even know. I, I was so, or at least maybe I would have known at the time. I completely forget the mythology. David. The original. Uh, um, was your weapon a slingshot? Yeah, I know. Uh, well, it, I. I I would not be surprised at all, you know, hearing your story, that obviously he was, you know Joe, he, he's, he writes space opera, right? And of course he's going to be telling parables and all kinds of stuff. It's a little too similar to your storyline. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I had no idea where Joe would have taken our show and had gone. Uh, um, I think my understanding was they got the green light from the network to go ahead. I don't even think there was anything beyond a very broad or maybe even a brief outline. I think it cranked out our script in two weeks. Um, you know, I might, might say in some areas it shows a little bit, but um, uh, I, yeah, I sure it wasn't thought through, but then I hedged that a little bit knowing Joe is maybe you guys all know, right? I mean, Joe's a bit of a unique writer. And, you know, he, he is a little bit of a, a creative genius. And, uh, we may yet see it. You know, so um, I don't know, but I should also mention too that you know, um, while shooting that, we did have Andreas from the original cast with us to sort of help you know shepherd us into the into the light there, and it was a real honor and treat to work with Andreas, such a really really talented actor, obviously, and uh, you know I was a little nervous uh, working <laughs> opposite him. You know, I was a little kid still, I felt at that time, and. Uh, I uh, knew that I had to bring my A-game, and um, he was just such a gracious, gracious man. Uh, really humble, uh, always open for questions or talking, and he was just, you know, when when action was called, it's like there's Jakar, and he's just, man, he's so, so talented. Uh, so uh, it was a real privilege for me to work with him. He was, so, he was Jakar before you got to work, wasn't he? It probably, yeah, I never yeah. saw Andre. I don't actually know if I ever saw Andreas. That's what I mean. On set, because he's in uh, makeup at four o'clock in the morning. He's so early; that's really involved makeup, and you know, a long time afterwards. And, and I was about the only guy not in makeup in that whole cast. So uh, yeah, but you know, it's it's very sad. Obviously, he's passing, and um, yeah, I just have great memories from that. So yeah, we should open up to questions while we think of more things to just you know ramble on about. <laughs> <laughs> that's just going down the corridor. So I mean, like, if that's setting the precedent, we have no chance of doing anything. Anyway, I'll hand you back to the big guy. He's just so much better looking. I'm not casting anything quite yet. <laughs> now, stunts, and you also got to keep in mind, too, where you're doing stunts, because uh, it depends where in the world you're shooting. You know, we're very, very safety conscious here in the United yeah. States and Canada, Think and obviously Britain. Britain. You go to, uh, but accidents happen with all of that kind of stuff. The worst... One of the worst experiences I had in this area was I did something in China. Uh, it was a TV series that Dennis Hopper was doing, and I don't think it ever got seen. It, the Dennis I, Hopper? I heard later it was really just a, a money laundering exercise from the Chinese mafia. It went for 100 million in one season. <laughs> <laughs> but no luck to matter. Um, no, seriously, it was crazy. I mean, the horror stories you can imagine. Uh, Two stuntmen got decapitated on a uh, car scene. They broke for 45 minutes. Cleaned up the mess, got to work. Another time, uh, they had me hanging off a 10-story building in, um, uh, I'm supposed to be like kind of hanging on, and I was in rigging. We were, it's called rigging, right? When you're hanging stuff, and, and this is definitely circa 1950. Looked nothing like what I'd ever worn in the United States. I look at my cable where it's supposed to be tied off, and I see like just, five guys, ten stories down, just holding the end. Oh so like, God. if there's a communal sneeze, 
<laughs> you know, and, um, and I was getting hurt. They're, they're dropping me down, I'm supposed to be hanging, and I was getting hurt. And I was um, basically yelling up, okay guys, I'm done, I need to, you know, I'm kind of hurt here, and no one's listening, and I'm feeling like I'm actually the only one holding on at this point as I'm looking at these guys. So I start to flip out. And it was the first time, I flipped out twice in my life as a 25 year veteran actor. Second time very well deserved with the director. This was the first time, I lost it. I'm screaming like a, like a chicken with his head, you know, chopped off. I get up foaming at the mouth, I'm done, I'm like, you know, just like frothing, frothing. I tear it off, you know, and you know, I think they got what they needed, but the, that was it for that day. So it depends on where you're uh, shooting. I, I would never go to places like China again unless it were complete studio level, big budget, you know, Michael Bay type stuff because, uh, you know, crazy, crazy, uh, scary stuff happens, um, you know, outside of the United States, the stunt oh, yeah. arenas. So, on that happy note, <laughs> Thanks, anyone got some good uh, decapitation stories? <laughs> Thanks for cheering us up. Man. Yeah. No. <laughs> no question. Yeah. Question. Question. I'm sorry for. Oh, uh, me. Yes. Really. Uh, the camaraderie between you and Richard Biggs came off quite a bit. What's your favorite story with him on and or off screen? <laughs> well, no, no. He was my dear, 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 dear friend, and we did lots of conventions together. So you're not going to hear the off stage stories. <laughs> <laughs> I had nothing to say at his memorial service because we were very close. It's funny, it's funny how that works. Um, I, he's just, just, I, great, so it was just great to work with. We, we had a really good time together, and I can't think about much. We, we had fun on the set of Babylon 5, but we, we had a, a great camaraderie on the convention circuit. And it started out having to do conventions. He persuaded me to do conventions in the first place because I'm an actor, but I've been on stage playing roles and all that business, but to walk out on stage as yourself? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to say? And the first time I did it um, was actually in London at the BBC Theatre in Shepherd's Bush, and all the cast were there, and we were all given an hour, and I was following Peter Jurassic. <laughs> Come on, Peter Jurassic did 45 minutes before he fielded a question. <laughs> That's how wonderful a raconteur is. He's a bloody professor, for God's sake. He, he, he can just talk. He's but, uh, so I go out there and, 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 and I can't do what he did. Anyone got any questions? <laughs> and then I'm 40 minutes in or something like that, and there's no more questions. And I'm just standing there. You can feel the angel leaving. You know, it's just like. I just go, do you want to hear a poem? <laughs> I did some poems, I wrote a drama school and they liked them. And then, and I just read, it took me a while to get, anyway, Rick, 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 um, Rick persuaded me to go to conventions and then I'm at a particular convention when the show's on. So we've got a big room, there's about 1,500 people in the room, you're lit and you can't see the audience because you're all like on a stage and everything like that. And they've got a microphone at the back of the hall. And any more questions? And a question comes from the microphone at the back of the hall. Who do you least like in Babylon 5? What actor did you least like in Babylon 5? Actor or actress did you like in Babylon <laughs> And I'm kind of like, really? Uh, <laughs> I can't really answer that. No, I'm dying. I'm dying. And I managed to sit because in the early days I was a bit more nervous than I am now. I'm really relaxed now, you can tell. <laughs> and, and, and I see, and it's Rick Biggs. <laughs> so I say, I hated Rick Biggs, if you like. And then a chase ensued around the theatre, everybody liked it. And from then on, we made it for some reason, because it just going on. If he had an hour and I had an hour, then we both have two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Gluttonous for tension. We just both do the gig together. So we'd get crash each other's gigs, and, it was a, and then we went to conventions together and, and, and parted our arse up, really. But uh, that, was, that was when there was lots more fan run conventions, you know, like the. the um, when those days, when we had Klingons with blood wine and everyone's getting completely arsehole, those were the days. <laughs> it's all true, though, isn't it? Now all we got is polyamory, and I'm not going there. <laughs> sorry, sorry, no, no, don't mean to offend anybody. Life choices are life choices. <laughs> <laughs>
Tony, but yes. I don't know the <laughs> He hasn't seen the show, don't worry. Um, is, is that intellectual property being what it is? Oh, is oh, yes! No, 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 no. I'm telling you the story of how this came about. Oh, okay. Is that your scripts turn up at your house and they're delivered by motorcycle dispatch riders. You don't send scripts for the things that haven't been made through the mail. So every week, because you're in the series, the, the script shows up. And uh, first thing you know, oh, am I in it? Am I not in it? Oh, I'm in it. <laughs> but one day, so fair enough, then you go and read it and find out whether, what you're going to do. A, the script turns up, I get the script, open it up, and inside the envelope is a script, some sheet music, <laughs> and a CD of Pirates of Penzance. <laughs> WTF? <laughs> so I read the script and then, what? And I have got to go, I got to sing, we were on a trip to Mars and we were in a hole with, it's me and Dr. Franklin, Richard Biggs, and, um, and we've got nothing to do. And I've been doing I Spy games and winding them up and stuff like that, and I said, we've got nothing to do at all. And uh, so I start singing Modern Major General, this is in the script. <laughs> and the very model of the Modern Major General. That is a really hard song. But, um, but also because there have been some politics gone on a couple of weeks earlier, I won't go into it, but whatever. That I was going to learn the whole bloody song. So I did, I did. But um, I don't really remember it now. That was a wrong... Are you really asking me to do this? <laughs> that was fine, but since then my balls have dropped. <laughs> I, 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 it won't be the right tune, but I am very modern of a modern major general. I have information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England, and I quote the facts historical. From Marathon to Waterloo, in order categorical. I'm very well acquainted with maths mathematical. I understand equations with the simple like quadratical. But by no theorem, I'm teeming with a lot of views. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. With many cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... Oh! Very good at integral and differential calculus. I know the scientific names of beings in Amalcubus. In fact, in matters vegetable, animal, and mineral, I am the very model of a modern major general. <laughs> and at this point, of course, Ripping Skyers goes, Shut up! I must rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> how, how long did you uh, have to work on that when they gave you that? Well, it, it's a just a couple of days before. Well, it's, you get the script because the episode is happening. So, was, oh, wow. so you're just listening awesome. to the CD, and believe me, it's quite a difficult tune, and that yeah. wasn't quite the tune, but, but no, I'm going to learn it, whatever. Uh, There's yeah. an R over there. We've probably been here for at least an hour now. Oh my god, it's just broken, it's stuck. <laughs> yes, it's all right. <laughs> you all were talking about the salaries you get? Mm. But so sketch, which, mm. which are nice per episode. Yes. You only get paid if you're in the episode, and how do you plan out? Because you never know how many episodes you're going to be in. That's about right. <laughs> <laughs> that would depend on your agents. Okay. Ah. Um, it is <laughs> a raw deal if you have that. By the way, uh, a series regular. Well, I will say, generally speaking, should get what's called all episodes produced. So if you're not in that episode, you got to, I, in my opinion, you have a raw deal if you're not getting paid. It does happen. There are deals <laughs> like that. Uh, foreigners sometimes get that when they first come to L.A. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's not really funny, but kind of a related point to that. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I uh, 
I have some uh, very, if I may say, uh, high-powered uh, attorneys that I work with now, just because I produce and I do other things. And Super when you powers. when you <laughs> when you produce and write, contracts get very uh, complicated. Actors' salaries when you're not a big star are generally uh, straightforward. There's a lot of back and forth, and it you know it, it's a uh, it's kind of a pissing contest to see where you, that final number is. But what happens? Um, what's going on right now is, for example. Uh, on Game of Thrones, huge, successful show, right? There's a lot of money on that show. And uh, my attorneys were, were just talking about how some of those Brits who don't have <laughs> American representation are some of them getting as low as like 9,000 an episode. Others, American reps, are making 100,000 an episode. So. There lies the art of the deal, right? So, um, what you try to avoid is being screwed. <laughs> yeah. In my opinion, those actors are really getting screwed. But they're in a contractually binding, sticky, they can't get out of that. That's what they signed. And what we we're talking about in Britain, I know, Brit British actors in Britain get paid very, very poorly. Television uh, and film. And what happens uh, stateside, you know, there's a bit of a uh, back and forth brouhaha that, uh, you know, a lot of Brits and Aussies and even Canadians are, are getting cast all the time in uh, American pilots and I'm talking mostly television. <coughs> a lot of the time, it, it, it's a, a very clear artistic choice and it, it's the right choice, or you can argue whether it's the right choice. But another factor is that Brits will sign at a much cheaper <laughs> level because bottom level American pay is very, very good. And, you know, everybody's trying to save costs, uh, you know, is the, the problem in the television industry and film, but in a different way, the television industry is, of course, each year we have fewer and fewer eyeballs watching our programs. That affects our ad rates, which is essentially paying for what's going on, but of course with inflation shows are more and more expensive. So the whole business model is actually quite broken in television. So if you can save what seems like a small amount, a couple of thousand dollars every episode, that does get the attention um, of, of a studio and a network. And what happens when we go to these auditions for a series regular, traditionally speaking, is you go through a number of uh, preliminary auditions, you get whittled down, you get whittled down. You then go to um, producers, let's say it's final producers, from that, they make their selection. Let's just say, generally speaking, it might be four or five actors make the final cut. At that point, before a decision is made, your contracts are made up. This gives the networks and studios leverage. The actors don't know who's gonna get it. So, your deals are made at that point. Back and forth, back and forth, haggle, haggle. Then, you go to the final two auditions. First one is called studio. You go to the studio. The studio is actually the one that's funding the bills for a, a television show. The networks essentially are kind of renting. They make their money from the advertising. So the studio gives their approval of who goes forward. Sometimes it's all four. Sometimes someone gets nixed right there. So let's say one gets nixed. You're down to three. Then you go to network. That's the final audition. And it's about the most brutal experience that you know, actors can go yeah. through. It's, it's, you know exactly the amount of money that's on the line. Most of us are usually quite starving at all times, so it's a big deal, right? <laughs> and we're dealing, we're talking about the arts. So you have an audition and you get one take. It's not as though let's play around and do multiple takes, you get one take. And as we know, you can't kind of control art. It's a performance. Sometimes you have a good night on stage, sometimes you have a really shitty one. You don't have room for error. So anyways, you go into this room and it's a tiny little office usually, and there's often literally about 30 people all lined up, standing room only, like, you know, just a couple of feet in front of you. And there's a chair or a spot right in front, no one says anything, you walk in, they just kind of basically nod, you do your thing, out the room, that's it. And then you wait for the phone call. So, <clears throat> at that point, if you've got two actors, and basically everyone's going, yeah, either one. What's the difference? I don't know, let's look at their contracts. You know, if that Brit's coming under 30,000 an episode less, you know, and let's say, you know, if we're talking about the lead and a big show, there could be a sizable difference if someone's coming into it with, 
let's say me, I've had eight TV series, so there's something called a quote. Uh, my quote can be quite substantial. If someone's coming out of Britain, it's their first time, this is their first quote. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a fraction of what I'm making. And so that can play into it. People can price themselves out of a role. And that's also the game that you're playing when you make that contract, how hard you want your guys to play pit bull, right? How badly do you want that? How much do you think they really want you? Because that's the other thing you're kind of gauging, right? They don't want to give up their cards. You know, you don't know if your first choice going into those final ones usually. Sometimes you can get tipped off, but, you know, so it's a game. It's a game that's being played. So that's a really long-winded answer to, to that. People get screwed over all the time, and you know you learn from it and try to move on. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Sounds like you're making the case that immigrants will do jobs Americans don't want. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> no, see that's the case. No, believe me, the Americans want the jobs. <laughs> it sounds like so. LA is now all about you get Mexicans to do the garden and you get Brits to do your acting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take over time. I have a, I have a very interesting thought on this. What, how long are we supposed to be going until then? Forever. Forever. We're good? Okay. All right, here's an interesting thing. You know, people complain. People complain in our industry, generally, mostly a lot of actors and Americans. You know, if you read the trades, if you pay attention, there are a lot of Brits and Aussies um, that take the uh, tough guy leading man roles, particularly in film. I mean, if you, if you look at a lot of guys, they, 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 Chris Hemsworth and the others. You know, the young guys, you know, the young guys coming up. But going all the way back to, you know, Richard Burton and on and on and on. Um, for some reason, casting directors are lamenting that they have it, almost an impossible time trying to find young American male actors that can portray a real kind of uh, natural, tough ruggedness. And if they can do it, they're immediately gobbled up into film. Uh, and so, there's something about, and, and I think if you think about it, it, it's very true, there's something in the DNA of uh, Aussies, Kiwis, Brits, uh, that they still have a real rough and tumble, and of course when you look at the, uh, the Aussies, you know, going back to their whole penal colony formation, <laughs> I do believe, there is this rugged individualism in Aussies that, and I worked with Lucy Wallace, and she's tougher than most men I work with uh, half the time, you know? And uh, it's an interesting uh, conundrum that casting directors deal with. And, and I won't go on and on and on about the gut theories, but what's really interesting is that there's been no Canadian, basically in the history of cinema, <laughs> that has ever played a rough, tough guy in uh, A-level star movies. And I'm not talking, obviously, our, um, you know, we got Kiefer Sutherland, basically Canadian, but he's more TV, and we've got Ryan Gosling, definitely going to win an Oscar, a serious, serious dramatic actor, but we did never produce a Richard Burton, we've never produced the Russell Crowes, people who are basically kind of a-holes in life, but they're <laughs> so magnetic on screen for that reason. And so I think Canada's got a little bit of a PC problem going on. But, uh, uh, although we can produce hockey players for some reason. Anyway, I'll stop there. I, I, I got a whole treatise on this. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I got it really. Oh! <laughs> in real life, yes, maybe you know you can really hold himself. But come on, come on. You gonna put Shatner in any kind of Russell Crowe? Maybe I just don't see it. Maybe it's just me. Gladiator. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what we do make in Canada is comedians, of course, because Canada's got that little brother syndrome with the United States. They have such a love-hate relationship, and what do you get with the little brother in the classroom, sit in the back and make fun of all the cool quarterbacks, right? They hate talking about it, but that's why they produce so many Canadians. They've got this, this bug up there, you know what, about being the little, the little country next door. That's it. That's the reason. Where's your tooth? My tooth. Oh, I've been out of Canada for a long, long time. But actually, I, I have many when I go back, believe me. You need them. All right, then, let's go to the bar. <laughs> Either you or someone else did it. I, I, I know I may appear to be irreverent, but when it comes to work, I'm very, very, I've always been that way. I'm very well aware that everyone else is doing a job. So if I screw up, I'm not going to suddenly launch into some variety performance so I make it into the blooper reel. I'm going to say sorry. 
because other people are doing their work as well. And unfortunately, once in the blooper reels, they, they cut together a bunch of me saying sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a bunch of pals. But, <laughs> Whatever. But no, I, I don't really do that riding up to the set like Joey Doral did on a motorbike or stuff like that when it's your entrance. Because uh, I probably wouldn't get away with it. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's not... It's not the place. When you, I, I'm weird. But what did somebody else do that you thought was funny? <laughs> Well, like, the only thing I can think about was actually on stage, and that's very different. And that's where you're doing Romeo and Juliet, and that was the last year at drama school that was in Lambda, and I was playing Romeo. We are on tour of Holland and Belgium. And we were in some Dutch big opera house, because the great thing about the Marshall Plan is every small town got an incredible high-tech big theatre. That's incredible. But that was cool. And anyway, so I'm on stage, and it's after we are being dead, Romeo and Juliet, because we've got to that point in the tragedy, and the rest of the cast are there grieving over these two lovers, star-crossed lovers, and in comes Friar Lawrence. And then, I, I mean, I didn't actually witness this, but it doesn't matter, <laughs> is that suddenly all the group around us as we're lying there are grieving really violently. <laughs> There's a lot of serious grief, because Gary Rainsford, he was now later actually, wasn't he? But Gary Rainsford was playing Brian Lawrence had come on stage with his cassock and the audience behind him. But he's walking up the stage towards Romeo and Juliet and he is let his cassock drop open and he's bollock naked up there. So. <laughs> <laughs> he's walking. So that was one of the events that happened on that tour. And the, the, the once I actually did, I was working, I was doing uh, Molly as the Miser with Rob Moody and if Rob Moody played Fagin yes. in the film Oliver. Yeah. Well, I'm not, and he's probably the late Ron Moody now, I'm sure he is, but I was playing Cleonte's son in Body as the Miser, and we had this very hate relationship, love hate between father and son. But he, as an actor, was being famous. We play, we're doing a bloody farce, for God's sake, so you can't break it up. But he might stop and like, be talking to the audience and stuff like that. Well, the curtain call would go on for incredible length of time because he suddenly burst into a song or something, and the rest of the cast standing there going, Really? <laughs> you know, but, uh, so this has been going on, and uh, me being a young actor, because I was young, much younger then, was really pissed off about this thing. Well, I, I, once, I just got a the once I'm having a fight with him on stage, and it's getting you know, really angry, but I, was, I grabbed him and I went crazy on him. You know, because it was within the context of the, the yeah, piece, yeah. but I just went absolutely crazy with the lines. His reaction afterwards was, oh yeah, that was great, we should really work together. It was a weird response, but anyway, one night, I, I, you know, I just went a kind of a um, reaction to the way things were going, and I, I made this entrance on the stage, on this, this balcony at the back of the stage, and I'm walking along it because I've come to the front of it, with the, the whole of the rest of the cast pretty much looking up at me. I made my entrance to go on my lines, as usual, but I'm holding a banana. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was a great, great, uh, I don't know, revenge then, because of course, a banana? <laughs> No explanation at all, but just holding the banana. <laughs> <don't know. laughs> so that was, that was a good revenge moment. Anyway, that was me. What about you? <laughs> no, I, I'm exactly like Jason. I, I, I'm not a... Nah. I'm too worried about getting fired. Uh, each job's too important. And, uh, and I've just never been on sets. Um, it also, you know, I think a lot of that stuff that you hear about and read about, that's from big budget uh, films. <laughs> Everybody's making so much money. Everybody's already a star. They're in a far different position. In television, A, <laughs> You don't have time and the money to screw up production for a, you know, anything serious. And um, Offset, we're too tired after a 16 hour day, literally, or even 17 hours, sometimes it's even more. Uh, I, I've just not been on a show like that, and I don't think it happens as much in television uh, as, as it probably does in film and, and on bigger films where it's just a completely different vibe, you know? Sorry, it's not great. Sorry, we're not, we're not much fun. We're not much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Just on stage. Yeah. Well, we should.